Good afternoon and welcome to the Historical Society of Carroll County's Box Lunch Talk. This is our October talk and we're very excited about the subject and it's sort of a love at first sight um, story that we're going to hear from Dorothy Mollett, um, better known as Dort, and she has been the, on our board of directors for several years and has been the chairman of the Legacy Gala for the last two years, and we're really thrilled to have her here today to speak. Um, Dort, as she's called, with her husband Richard, owns and operates Ant Antrim 1844 in Tawny Town. The former Carol County Women of the Year attended Hannah Moore Academy, North Carolina Wesleyan College, Towson University, and the Maryland Institute of Art, College of Art. Um, she uh, was the fundraising chair for Family Tree of Baltimore and a charter docent for the National Aquarium in Baltimore. She has chaired the fundraising committee of the Junior League of Baltimore, and um, the Mollets are recipients of the, America, of the Maryland Historic Preservation Award um, for their work at Antrim, and I, I'm not sure it's not some other things as well. Um, Antrim has received numerous honors, in, including the Maryland Restaurateur of the Year Award, Hotel of the Year Award for the Condé Nast uh, publications, a Distinguished Restaurant of a North American America Award from Girona, and the Wine Spectator Award. Um, Antrim is also a top 10 dining destination in the Baltimore, Washington area and has been cited by Zagat's Guide. Antrim participates in fundraising events each year from Carroll, for Carroll, Baltimore, and Frederick counties. And I'd like to welcome our fearless leader in the legacy <laughs> gala, but also uh, um, one of our most um, I guess one of our best supporters, and, and I want to thank her for doing this. I know she's a little bit nervous, which... <laughs> Are you coming? <laughs> Is this on? Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous, and I forgot that I had done all those things that Gaynor said I had done. We're kind of busy up there at um, Antrim. But I was honored six months ago when they asked me to give this talk. I said, oh, I would love to, and about two days ago, I was like, why did I say I'd give this talk? So anyway, bear with me. I'm here, um, and I would love to tell you all uh, a little bit about uh, restoring first time that Richard and I saw Antrim all the way to the present um, and give you some of the history and architecture so I think this is how you work this thing hold on oh <laughs> this was actually um, on your uh, program uh, so anyone here has probably already read that this presentation is um, about the story of restoring the house and the reason it's called a love affair was because when Richard and I first saw it and I'll get into this a little bit further detail we just everyone else said oh my gosh it's cold dark abandoned and deserted and we saw Antrim for the first time back in 1987 and we just said oh, Oh my God, this is the most beautiful. It was like Sleeping Beauty. It just needed a little kiss slash paint and a little bit of restoration and we could bring it back to its original splendor and glory. So don't ask me why we got involved, but that, that's the love affair. So we're going to initially start with the wonderful history and architecture of Antrim that made us fall in love with it when we saw it over 30 years ago. So let's see what we got, what we have here. Um, okay, one typo, I didn't do this. Colonel Andrew Eve, like Christmas Eve, really is Colonel Andrew Eggy, E-G-E. -E. So I'm sorry about that. But this is where the history of Antrim begins. And quite honestly, I will say that that photograph in black and white reminds me very much of the very day 
that we saw Antrim. And um, it was in November, so there were no leaves on the trees, and there had not been a lot of um, uh, manicuring done to the house as it had been abandoned for years, and we'll get into that too. But the history of Antrim is really the fact that it's nestled in the foothills of the Catoctin Mountains in uh, Tawny Town. It's um, always been, when it was built in 1844, um, it's always been a very prominent mid-19th century working agrarian plantation. And uh, it best depicts the, light, the style of Greek Revival architecture with um, a little bit of federal influence and I have to say that the um, architecture of Antrim is breathtaking. It is um, your traditional um, grand entrance hall with foyer and vestibule, um, and then the 14-foot ceilings. The um, architecture, I, I will get into a little bit further, but the amazing thing about the mansion was it was 17,000 gracious square feet of a home, someone's home, when Andrew Eggie built it, and um, it was supported by all of the outbuildings that it would have taken to run a gracious 17,000 square foot, many, many acre plantations. So why were they all left standing so many years, 200, I mean 150 years later when we first saw Antrim. And the outbuildings being the ice house, the post house, the old carriage house, um, all of these buildings supported the lifestyle. The old barn down over the hill, um, there were, um, the, you could see where the gardens once were, the very gracious European styled gardens because Andrew Eggie was actually his family heritage was from County Antrim, Ireland. Hence a lot of the European flavor of the uh, of Antrim and also I noticed if, when I've been in Europe and toured historic uh, homes there so many similarities to the gardens and the accessibility, to the, the recreational things like the tennis courts. The, um, it's just a very graciously designed house. Well, um, and the, the summer kitchen, the smokehouse, the um, spring house, um, everything that you would have expected to be in a mid-19th century plantation is miraculously preserved. It's almost like frozen in time at Antrim. And that's why I just think it's an American treasure. Hmm, I just got choked up <laughs> because everyone should come and enjoy the fact it's in Carroll County. It's just a beautiful landmark. It's a true American treasure. And in this day and age, we need a little old-fashioned graciousness and civility. So I do invite you all at any time just to drive up. You can pull right in the driveway. You can enjoy the gardens and the, the, the house. You might not want to go into some of the guest rooms because there may be a paying guest taking a nap or something in there, but you're always welcome to enjoy your, um, your heritage and legacy up there in Tawny Town, right here in Carroll County. And actually, let's see, um, what I wanted to tell you about the history, it of course was involved in many different aspects of history from 1844, and ironically, um, Andrew Eggy eventually went bankrupt. It was a little bit bigger than I think he had expected. And my husband Richard can many often, there have been a few sleepless nights when he felt sympathy for Andrew Eggie, feeling a little bit the, the same way. But then it was sold, trade, changed hands to a gentleman named Piper, and um, it was always used for gracious uh, weddings, gracious parties, lovely occasions. And I think it's a little bit um, cool now that now that it, we've turned it into a country inn and restaurant and wedding facility that it's almost reverted back to what it was originally designed to be 
back in the 1840s when a, a very lovely, prominent family lived there. Unfortunately, now you have to have a, your credit card when you come to him, or else we wouldn't be there. That money tree never grew in the backyard at Antrim. <laughs> so anyway, um, legend has it that um, General Meade, we in Tawny Town like to believe this legend, that our marvelous cupola at the top of Antrim, which is breathtaking, you can see for, for miles, that they actually, General George Meade, who was encamped with his camps um, just outside of Tawny Town limits, um, you always hear that the generals always went to people's homes and they had lovely dinners and were entertained and drank port and smoked good cigars. And uh, we, we in Tawny Town believe that they used the cupola at Antrim to watch some of the progress of the troops from, uh, from the vantage point up there. But moving on throughout the history, um, the Clayball family bought it in the uh, 1870s. And they actually lived there for almost 100 years, the Clayballs and the Lambertons. And I think that's very stately that a family would have something like that until um, George and Pauline Krauss bought it in, I want to say, 1960s. Sandy, you can correct it, somewhere around there. Sandy Krauss is here. And um, they actually, they, I don't think they ever lived at Antrim, but um, George. Krauss loved Antrim, and he would open it up on nice warm days and sunny afternoons, and he would have um, some fundraisers there. He would have uh, play cards, or I heard old George Sr. was quite a character, and I heard he had a lot of um, fun uh, sharing Antrim in, in that regard. And then, um, uh, let's see, throughout the... Um, 19th century and into the 20th century, Tawny Town actually was um, pretty much a prospering, it was really getting its roots and prospering quite a bit. They had um, uh, a huge carriage building shop, they had three cigar factories, the railroad went through there. Um, in the early 80s, uh, they had um, uh, phone and electricity uh, er, very early on. So it's kind of um, interesting that Tawny Town was maybe more prominent back in the early uh, 20th century than it is now. And somehow all of the things shifted and I think Westminster eventually became more of the hub and I'm not exactly you know, uh, sure uh, it, why. Maybe it was closer to Baltimore or more accessible. But um, anyway, up until um, that pretty much is my little short history up until, um, uh, up until now. And then I want to tell you why we, uh, what we think is so spectacular about Antrim. First of all, um, Robert Mills is a famous architect in history, and he is accredited for uh, having a, a much to do with the building um, of Antrim. And one of my favorite stories this is so easy to do when I give tours at Antrim because I just walk through and I just point, whoops, the mic, and I just point to things so it jogs my memory. But now you have to bear with me because I have to, like, it has to come to my mind without seeing it. But um, uh, the whole Greek Revival federal style architecture to me is so breathtaking. It's very simplistic but very elegant and what strikes me the most when I um, first saw Antrim, the porches are all 14 feet tall, the ceilings when you walk inside 14 feet tall, the cantilever staircase that is an elliptical stairway that, that um, spirals up to the third floor, up to the widow's walk, is immaculately built. All the windows, the interior shutters, the, even the bars, the sticks inside the window well, they were all miraculously preserved there as if they were waiting for some nutty people to come along and say, we can restore Antrim, we can do this. All the bones in the structure of the house are impeccable. The um, 
the white marble mantles in the drawing rooms ha- are hand carved by William Reinhardt, who you all know is from Carroll County and is a world renowned architect. They named the Maryland Institute of Sculpture after William Reinhardt. I just think that's so spectacular. Whew, I don't even know where we were. We, um, oh, I talked about the beautiful staircase. Um, even the original um, hand-turned cherry banisters, when we walked in and the house hadn't been lived in for Sandy, you can vouch for it. No one really lived in the house for over 50 years. Um, and it, it, the sun was beaming in the west side of the windows and hitting the soft, hard pine original floors. They were the hand turned cherry on the banisters and up to the third floor. It looked like someone had just polished them with furniture polish. And it was just all the hand oil that had rubbed the banister. The, the natural guts and beauty of the architecture, it was stunningly intact. Even the ornate plaster ceiling medallions in the center of each grand room, the drawing rooms, the formal dining room, the library, they were individual pieces of plaster that were handmade from a mole, and then they would just the master craftsman would just take loose horse, uh, the horsehair plaster, they would just take loose plaster to plaster and mount these amazing, I don't see a picture there, you'll have to believe me, the, or come and see it. The amazing ceiling medallions are, were, all orig- were all intact and um, the uh, crown molding around the rooms was, was also plaster. And that is such a dying art. The old Italian master's way of building the moldings was, uh, it, it's just a treasure that they were all in place. I, that reminds me of a story when we first moved in and we had um, Fern Radke's electrical company come in and we're like, oh, we need to get a couple outlets in here and a little bit of electricity. We're going to turn this into a little bed and breakfast. And um, I was working in one of the other rooms and I heard this drill turn on and it was sounded really loud. So I ran into the drawing room and there was one of, I think it was Mike Rodkey, he was probably 20 years old, and he said, I said, oh my gosh, what are you doing? And he's up on a ladder with a power drill and he was going to drill. The ceiling medallions had never been electrified. They were methane gas. So that was the last power source that lit the chandeliers. Well, the chandeliers were gone. The methane gas coupling was left. And um, Mike was just going to drill across the plaster molding, across the horsehair plaster ceiling, across the ornate ceiling medallions, and get a nice little electricity to the chandelier. Well, I said, stop, don't do that. Don't you dare touch the ceiling. So we figured out, and this is where Richard's expertise comes in. He is the um, engineer of how to modernize a beautiful old home and turn and, and make and make it useful and usable today. So Richard thought about it, and he said, you know what? That methane gas has to go through some pipe systems from um, throughout this house because the methane sconces were up to the third floor. So he's like, why can't we go upstairs above the drawing rooms and the, uh, the first floor and just take up one floorboard and sh- to the center of the room? And sure enough, every single room had the methane gas pipe system running through it and we were able to feed the electrical wires through the floorboards and replace them. And that was totally Richard's, uh, Richard's idea. Same thing with the plumbing. The house is so structurally, immaculately built. The interior walls are even. Horsehair plaster on brick with an air pocket between the brick walls. And that allowed for the sliding doors to slide in. Also, the air pocket worked as insulation, natural insulation. And that would keep the air inside, would keep the bricks within a 10 or 15 degree temperature change. And 
we, we had to get plumbing. You can't really have a bed and breakfast and say, oh, oh, and by the way, the outhouses are back here in the lovely formal garden. Just take your own, you know. Um, so we had to get, figure out all the way to the third floor how to get plumbing. So this was my idea. In between, that we had to run these giant, ugly waste lines, the sewer lines from the top to, to the bottom. So I said, why don't we run them through in, in the thick walls? There's an air pocket. And they, uh, absolutely not, that can't be done. No, we don't, do, you know, can't. I said, just humor me. Just put that pipe in the corner of this, the, where this wall, we had opened the floors to put in a bathroom. And um, sure enough, it just slid all the way down perfectly. And in that regard, we were able to put heating, plumbing, air conditioning, every single thing necessary to run a, um, a state-of-the-art country inn and restaurant and wedding facility. I don't think the brides would have really appreciated going out to the outhouse in her wedding gown. So we were able to never destroy one part of Antrim's uh, architectural beauty. And we hid everything in the servants' closets and through the walls and between the floors. And I'm really um, thrilled that we didn't have to run bulkheads and ruin the, the architecture. And that's why I still think to this day it's an American treasure with all of its natural, um, natural beauty. Um, the original floor plan is, you know, you can walk in the front door and see where the dining room, the library, the drawing rooms. And of course you all know why they called them drawing rooms. I'm sure, because in the day they would withdraw, the owners of the, of the house would withdraw from their lovely formal dining room, and the ladies would withdraw to the south drawing room. The gentlemen would close the enormous pocket doors that still work beautifully, um, and the gentlemen would retire, withdraw, to the north drawing room. And the guys would smoke scars, drink port, talk about the war that was coming up and all that good stuff. And the ladies were supposed to be sipping tea, chit-chatting, and sewing. So um, it got shortened to drawing rooms from the word withdrawal. And I always love to ask guests about that because, wow, the stories that they come up with um, their ideas are, are pretty entertaining. But I always said, I hope, when I give a tour at Antrim, I always say, I hope there was one of those women was like Scarlett O'Hara. And she had like in her, in her beautiful hoop skirt and gown, she had like a couple cigarettes and maybe a flask or something, like as soon as they closed those doors. You know, the girls had to have fun too, a little fun. But I just made that up. So um, don't, don't quote me on that. So anyway, the second floor beautiful bedrooms were for the owners of the, um, of, of the uh, mansion. And then interestingly, the third floor was for the children and probably some sort of an au pair babysitter up there. And most people didn't use their third floors. And Antrim was so strategically built that even in the circular stair, the um, uh, elliptical staircase that went up to the third floor, they put a gorgeous window to light the third floor. And of course, the cupola is 12 by 12 feet, all glass and closed. So it was the most beautifully lit third floor with little eyebrow hip windows. All the rooms are slanted, but with great square footage and they actually used all of the, um, uh, the all three floors for the family which I think is wonderful and then of course architecturally attached to the back of the mansion the architecture totally changes and it becomes very primitive and um, that's where the servants worked and there's uh, the finishing kitchen um, there's the summer kitchen the smokehouse um, there in within the uh, servants kitchen uh, there is a six 6,000 gallon cistern that works beautifully to this day if we ever need any extra water it collects of course off the roofs channeled underground and even the moat where the overflow moat where originally designed in 1844 if they had a, a rainy season it would flow out into the yard 
still works perfectly. It's just incredible how brilliant they were to utilize their resources. You can dine in the smokehouse now. The original hooks are all on the beams where they would hang the animals, the carcasses to smoke. And, you know, the, it, it's a functioning smokehouse if you wanted to do it today. The bake oven in the summer kitchen is there. And we light it up with a, uh, a, um, some visuals. And it's a huge bake oven. And you know how now the pizza ovens are back in style and you see the, the pizzerias and they have the big bake oven with the arch. It's an igloo of brick and it's vented out the main chimney. And you could build a fire kindling within the, um, within the oven. And when the bricks would heat up, and retain the heat. It was time to put your pies and bread and, and bake inside there. So how, do you know how they knew when it was warm enough, hot enough to bake bread? They would put a poultry feather, just a feather inside, and if it would disintegrate, it was hot enough to bake the bread. So then they would take a little kitchen rake, about this big, and they'd rake out the coals, and it would be a beautiful hot bake oven brick floor, brick walls, brick ceiling, and um, they would put the bread in. Well, we tried it a long time ago to see if it worked, and it baked bread in 10 minutes to a beautiful raised golden brown. So it just is kind of amazing when you walk through a historic property, and so much of it is still intact that you can just imagine what, you know, what went on back in the day when um, a lot of people, a lot of servants, um, helped from making the soap to the breads to the food to the getting on the, the table. It was quite a, um, uh, an effort of many, many people. So anyway, I'm trying to think because of our time frame, because I want to leave a little bit of time at the end for questions and hopefully I have answers. Well, if not, I'll make them up. So um, no fact-checking allowed. You just have to believe everything I say. Because I give tours at Antrim, and Richard, well, my husband will say to me, what house are you talking about? And I'm like, oh, that's close enough. That's close. A, a lot of history gets distorted. Did you know that over time? It gets embellished. Okay, what's my next, what's my next uh, attack? Oh, here. This is how I came to entitle, to, to decide the title of this box lunch talk today. And um, I named it Love at First Sight. And that's not in reference to me personally. It's in reference to when Richard and I walked in to Antrim, we immediately fell in love with its beauty and its graciousness and the fact that its bones and structure were it almost like it was preserved in time it was just frozen in time no one had ever converted it into cheesy apartments or dropped the ceilings or put the mother-in-law in the back room or anything like that it was just waiting to be a little bit of TLC I always say it's like sleeping beauty and um, just needed to be awakened. <laughs> so um, I thought it would be interesting, and stop me if this is boring, but um, I thought it might be interesting to know a little bit about where Richard and I came from and came up with the idea to restore Antrim to its original splendor. And um, it's kind of funny, back in the um, 70s, when I met Richard in um, 1970, we had this brilliant idea that we would buy old dilapidated houses that were once beautiful but had fallen in disrepair and turned into, you know, a thousand people living in them and, and lots of, uh, needed lots of work. So we did, I was an interior designer. Richard was in the car business with his stepfather. And we would, for fun, we would buy a terrible looking house in the best neighborhood we could possibly afford, and nobody else would want the house. And we would work on it on, in, on the weekends in our spare time, and we would fix them up, and we would flip them. And, of course, now they have TV shows about flipping houses, but I think it was our idea. 
back in the 1970s. So what we would do, we would just fix them up. Richard would get the structure of the house structurally in shape, and then I would come in with my wallpaper and my paint and my fabric. I can never say I made drapes, but you should see the window treatments I make. Now, none of them work. They're staple gun. They're glued up there to this day. They're at Antrim. Don't ever go look at how these beautiful draperies are, are installed because you'll see staples and wire and that kind of thing. But anyway, my job was to make it look pretty after Richard structurally brought it back, and then we would sell it. Well, we, we could sell, we could do one a year because people would just come along, and our goal was to take the money, if we had any profit, if we made five cents, we would go buy a little bit more challenge house, a little bit bigger. Well, we did this eight six, seven, eight times in the Baltimore City, Baltimore County area. And in the meantime, we were always working on our jo at our jobs, and we had a couple of children who, by the time they went to school, they had no idea where they lived. You know, your teacher would say, what's your phone number, what's your address? They would be, well... My mother zipped it in my coat pocket because we just moved again. So we always kept the kids in the same school in Baltimore, a little private school in Baltimore, but we would move all the time. And um, it was actually pretty funny They're, when they would go to a, a friend's house on the weekends and they'd live in a nice development and they'd be this nice new house at the end of a cul-de-sac and there was always dinner on the table and food in the cupboards and um, my kids would say can't we just live a normal life like other people and be like oh no somebody just bought the house we got to leave we're, we're, we're moving out so I thought it'd be fun for you all to know that we kind of came by it honestly that we we learned a lot the hard way with blood through blood sweat and tears and the last house we sold we needed another challenge and our real estate agent drove us up from Baltimore, and she said, oh, Tawny Town. I said, well, I've never really heard of Tawny Town. Could you, like, kind of tell us sort of where it is? Because our businesses are, we, are, we have to work in Baltimore, and our kids go to school in Baltimore. So we got to Westminster, and I said, well, this is pretty far away to commute every day. And the real estate agent said, oh, don't worry about it. It's only a couple more miles up the road. Well, I'm sorry. Tawny Town may only be 10 miles away from Westminster, but it's a long 10 miles. So we get up to Tawny Town. I'm like, absolutely not. We're n we can't do this. You know, just turn. I don't want to waste your time. Turn around. She said, well, since we're here, we might as well just pull in to Antrim and walk through it and just be polite. And, we, and so Richard and I got out of the car. It was a dreary day in November and that some of the trees had, were kind of leaning on the porches, the driveway nothing, the gardens had gone into disrepair um, with no electricity, no plumbing, it was a little bit chilly in there that um, insulation in the house had turned to freezers so <laughs> from not being used for 50 years and in the winter it was cold in there which actually probably preserved a lot of the plaster and a lot of the wood and in the house when I think about it um, so anyway we were polite and we op we walked into the front door of Antrim and our jaws just dropped in awe of how beautiful and magnificent that it really, this is a historic treasure that we, we just have to save Antrim. And Richard, I kept telling the real estate agent, this is amazing. Look at these windows. Look at these shutters. Look at this crown molding. I'm like, you, look at the staircase. And he kept poking me. And he'd say, shh, be quiet. Be quiet. Don't ever let a real estate, don't ever let them know you like the house. So it's like, well, we don't want to pay that much for the house. So we're like, I'm zipping it up, and we're walking through the house, and the whole time we're thinking, oh, my gosh, this is spectacular with the outbuildings and the, um, the working, the kitchens, the summer kitchens, the gorgeous formal rooms. So anyway, that was a very, um, how can I say it? turning point in our lives the day we saw Antrim and fell in love with it because I must say that was 30 years ago and we have been working on Antrim 
every day ever since, and we would die working on Antrim <laughs> for the rest of our lives. But I thought it might be fun for you all to know how we just really had a plan, and my real plan was just for me to turn it into a four-room bed and breakfast on the weekends. Well, you know what? That money tree died very quickly. Have you all ever seen the movie The Money Pit? Where they just, um, it was pretty funny that the house kept falling down as fast as they could put, put it back together. So um, when Richard came on board, he decided, oh, I'm tired of selling cars. Um, I'm going to get involved in the innkeeping business. And I was like, oh boy. So he put together a business plan, and he figured to make it a viable business, we needed a lot more rooms. We needed a place for our guests to dine that met the same caliber as the rooms they were sleeping in. We couldn't send them to Sheets for dinner or McDonald's, where my sons ate very often. They ate at Sheets. Here, have a couple bucks. Go get a hot dog. I'm surprised they're still alive, but they're fine. They're fine, really. Um, so anyway, we decided we needed many more rooms, and we needed uh, um, a restaurant, and then the weddings, because it's such a romantic and beautiful, historic, gorgeous wow. gardens, sun setting over the, over the west, the, the mountains and um, the Catoctin Mountains. It was just a beautiful place to have weddings. And a lot of the families throughout the previous 150 years had weddings and parties and, and entertained all the time. So it's kind of interesting that now that um, we really, after 30 years of purchasing other houses that were originally built around Antrim, taking some of the outbuildings, we moved a house onto the property, and inch by inch our business plans would go back to the bank after we'd pay them back for one little section, and we'd add more rooms. We'd borrow more money, we'd add more rooms, we'd borrow more money. So I'm very proud to say now that it's a 40 room. We can't say it's a bed and breakfast. We can't even say it's a country inn. Um, everyone in the industry calls it a boutique hotel, and the restaurant is internationally renowned, and I think we have some of the most gorgeous weddings. We have people from all over the East Coast and West Coast and, and even from Europe who have had weddings there. We probably do... Um, over 100 weddings a year, which is more than two a weekend. So, um, and the restaurant seats 100. And so I just want to brag a little bit that now Antrim is back to um, being a very bustling, very elegant, lovely place um, to, to entertain. So um, uh, in that regard, I think I um, mentioned a little bit about... Um, in this crazy mixed up time where every day I wake up and I look at the news and I wonder what terrible thing happened yesterday. It's not like, you know, the terrible things happen once a month or once a year. I mean, every day it's like, I, you know, I can't believe it. Well, we kind of feel like restoring Antrim has um, just a little tiny bit of graciousness, a little tiny bit of a civility and um, a, a, a air when it was okay to linger over afternoon tea for a, an extra hour, or it's okay to sit at dinner and have uh, multiple courses and see china and silver and glassware again. In our busy, bustling lives, I kind of think that Antrim captures an error that's long gone, but we certainly don't want to forget it. So anyway, that is sort of my little notes, and I think that I might open this up to um, uh, the fact these are some of the 24-acre outbuildings all over the property. I would need, like, a whole TV show to do all of the rooms and the buildings and whatnot, but 
Interestingly, that this uh, kind of funny, this is the Bernie House in the background here, where anyone who knows Carroll County history well knows that Dr. Bernie had his offices here in the Bernie House, and his two sisters, Amelia and Elizabeth, lived in the Bernie House. Well, interestingly, Richard and I bought Glen Burn from Elizabeth Neal about um, seven years ago, I guess, maybe more, maybe nine years ago. And Glen Burn was Dr. Bernie's um, some, his uh, country estate and his offices were here. So once again, the tie, the ribbon, is kind of tying back together the properties and the, we live at Glen Burn um, a couple miles away and that was the, the Bernie, Dr. Bernie's country house. So it's, that's kind of cool. And all, that's the old carriage house. If you look at the thing that's very confusing that looks kind of like a, a map of a college campus, that is pretty much, over the 24 acres, there are 14 individual buildings that have been restored into lovely, usable guest room spaces with modern bathrooms and fireplaces and heat and air conditioning. So, as you can see, we've been a little bit busy over the last 30 years, and um, that is what we have to show for it. And um, right now, um, I think Gaynor was sweet enough to say the restaurant has many accolades. And um, the basement, which, um, let me check my time. Oh, oh my gosh, I knew I would rattle on. I have no sense of time. Um, I just have to tell you, the, the wine cellar at Antrim, it's really the, of course, it's the basement of, a, of this gorgeous mansion. It was hand dug with a shovel, or two, or 10, or 15, but red Catoctin clay is about as hard a dirt as you can ever, ever imagine without a bulldozer, a caterpillar, or some John Deere thing. Um, they dug a 12 foot deep basement under the 17,000 square foot house. And it's um, a perfect wine cellar. And they would keep their root vegetables down there. It's 52 degrees year round. And Richard turned two, of the rooms under the drawing room into the most spectacular wine cellar. He has over, he has the, he does the wine program for the restaurant and it's his new baby with his history, not his knowledge of history, was a history major. He actually put together a wine program. He has over 20,000 bottles of wine that are immaculately marked that's a picture. If you really, really want to have a special occasion, um, there's a, uh, you can be served dinner in the wine cellar, and there's a table for 10, and it's pretty spectacular. So anyway, then and now, the, that's the smokehouse turned into a restaurant. The basement turned in. We'll do anything to make a, a buck. You know, we'll turn the chicken coop into a, into a room. You better be careful where, you know, where you're booking a reservation. But anyway, that's kind of an overview, and there's so much more. I wish you'd all come, and I give you a personal tour anytime. But um, a few pictures. Um, the formal gardens, we have painstakingly, inch by inch, gone from digging out the original um, gardens that we found when we went to the... Um, Historical Society archives, the library. We put back the pebble pathways, put in the fountains. Um, there on the lower left under the fountain is uh, an example of one of the lovely um, guest rooms that's right above the, uh, the drawing room. We call that the Boyd Room, long story. And um, one of the two drawing rooms that I was mentioning where the guys would pull the pocket doors and they're identical, spectacular rooms. And there you see William Reinhardt's uh, white marble mantle, the Monticello jib windows that um, are so beautiful, interior shutters, and those are my drapes that I staple gun up there. See, who would know? Who would know? No one. So anyway, I just wanted to show you a little, little thumbnail sketch. Um, that's the end of my PowerPoint, and I open up now anybody for questions, okay. but not too hard. Dort, <laughs> first of all, for somebody who seemed incredibly nervous when you started, that was one incredible presentation. That we are I all paid. grateful. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn, but I paid you to say that. You know I paid Marilyn to say that. Um, Thank yeah, you. I get to book a room at, eight, at, at Antrim now. No. Um, also, everybody, please remember to raise your hand so we can get a microphone to you so we can all hear the question. 
Dort, who yes? does your papering? Pardon me? Who does your papering? Who does my what? Wallpaper. Oh, Jim, these are like set up questions here. <laughs> um, before I was an interior designer, um, I wallpapered a lot of these old houses. Well, how are you going to get a house ready to flip over unless you know how to paint and wallpaper, right? So I'm the best wallpaper hanger in the whole wide world, and every single piece of wallpaper at Antrim I have hung, and those 14-foot ceilings, they're really tricky, but I can do it. Thanks, Jim, for the plug. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago, I read that uh, Antrim was built by slaves in the area. Is that true? And if not, who did build this wonderful house that lasted so long? Well, I have to be so politically correct these days. Uh, we, I know that they had slaves at Antrim. It's south of the Mason-Dixon line. It's a magnificent property that would need lots of, of, of help. Um, and what I'm, um, uh, I have read that they had over 40 slaves uh, prior to the Civil War, and they lived around the little, a tribute, there's a little creek around, um, and that home, their little wooden houses were around the creek, around the perimeter of Antrim, and um, none of them remained, unfortunately, because we would have restored them if they were there. <laughs> Um, but, yes, I do believe that um, there were slaves. And in, another interesting fact, all the bricks at Antrim were hand-fired in the area here out of the red Catoctin clay and sand. And if you touch those bricks a little bit too aggressively, they just disintegrate in your hands. But if you leave them alone, they are, they've been there for, what, 175 years. So the bricks were fired. Um, Richard told me that the beautiful arched doors in the cellar were brought from their redwood doors from California. The wood, he told me this. I swear he told me this. The wood was brought from California but in the day, it had to go around the horn to get the, the redwood lumber to the east coast of the United States. And those doors are in the wine cellar. Um, we end in the summer and in, in part of the right now to this day. And they were, they were um, by boat. They came from who, California, who which did, is pretty cool. Who did build the house? Did well, he leave records? Does and can anybody, Kathy? Who do you think built it? William, um, not William. Yeah, yeah. Um, Robert Mills designed the house. He's an architect. Um, the, some of the details were done by craftsmen who knew the pla art of plaster work. But actually, the men who would, you know, climb on the ladder and build the house, I don't have a record of that. Do you think it was the slaves? That's who were what, just instructed with what, you know, everybody, everybody built it. That's what I read, but it seems did hard to believe. Did you read it? Yes, no, I, I believe it. I believe it. The craftsmanship is also impeccable there. I mean, there isn't a brick there that, or a piece of stone that wasn't put there for a reason. So maybe they were just overseen by somebody. I'm not sure. Hi. Um, I have two little questions. One is, what is the roof made of? And two, did you have any issues with lead paint? Um, don't get me in trouble here. Okay, I'm just asking. Is if anyone you have, here if, from if whatever that there, EPA is, there, is or something? Because <laughs> they would have had lead paint back yeah. then. First, first of all, the roof, um, it, it's a seamed, uh, uh, the tin, yeah, oh, a seamed okay. roof. And some of it's still the original roof, and some of it we've replaced, like in uh, with uh, some of it in the servants' areas is like um, cedar shake, but a rid and the outbuildings that were there had cedar shake. So I think formal um, roof was it was a tin seamed t uh, metal roof, and then some of the outbuildings were cedar shake. Uh, hi, I have a question. Um, what is 
What did you find to be the most challenging project for you when you decided to restore the Antrim? Hmm. Hmm. The entire property has been challenging. <laughs> um, fortunately, we were naive enough to think that we could do this project, and I'm delighted we did because it, I feel like it's a legacy that hopefully will be preserved forever. Um, the most challenging, honestly, maybe putting the systems in to bring it up to date, and that would be the heating, the air conditioning, meeting the handicap codes. Now, mind you, the inspectors are there all the time, you know, making sure that your plumbing lines are two inches from the whatever. So we have always been under the um, uh, guidelines of the health department and the, um, and I didn't answer your lead paint question, but we, of course, had it, all of that was tested and asbestos. And um, um, my philosophy, but it's not legal, my philosophy, is, oh, I know why we didn't have a lead paint issue. The last time the house was painted, because I know probably um, Sandy will tell, I don't think George ever painted anything. He was just in, enthralled with the natural beauty like we were when you saw the house. It was milk paint. Have you all, you all know what milk paint is? It doesn't have lead in it. So as this paint aged on the woodwork and the walls, it really disintegrated and it wasn't dangerous. So we didn't have a lead paint issue and I don't think there was that much heating to worry about the asbestos either. So we kind of skipped the lead paint and the heating, the asbestos issues. That's my, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <clears throat> Anybody else? Mine's a two-part question. Okay. Uh, if I wanted to bring a group for tea, do you do that? And the second part is, could we have a tour? Um, uh, let me start with the first part. And you know what? We have a fabulous um, girl named Robin who um, works and does special events at Antrim. And um, she lines up anything from a tour of... 10 people uh, with, um, with, with tea or lunch or something. She, you have to call and make the arrangements, but we do individualize a lot up to, we have a lot of corporate retreats there midweek, and they come, they come by 45 people in a, you know, a, a bus and um, do Gettysburg and have lectures in the pavilion things. So the answer is yes, you can come and do that. And tour, honestly, uh, if you call me, I, I will set up a tour anytime with you all. I'm two minutes away, and I'd love to share the... You can actually touch the, um, the architecture and, and feel. It's really almost like all your senses just come alive when you come to Antrim. You can sort of touch, sense, and feel what it was like um, in that era. So, you're, yes, please. Thank you. Please. Do any of your children work with you in the business? <laughs> <laughs> or do they get that, their fill? Bro? Now that is a really, really good question. Having bumped them around to every part of the, oh, I didn't tell you the funniest story of all. They were in elementary and middle school when we moved out here. Two sons, Brandon and Ryan. And um, they were going to school at Boys Latin in Baltimore, Maryland, where my husband went to school. So it's kind of a family tradition. And they, um, uh, we told them we're moving to Tawny Town. And they said, where? I mean, what? Where is it? You know, and we, they said, we're not moving. And I said, well, uh, if you want to, you know, eat and, and have shoes, I guess you're moving with us because we're moving to Tawny Town. So they didn't have a lot of input in the project, and we took them out there, and they were aghast at the um, uh, magnitude of what we were just going to take on. And um, the fact that it was 40, 55, 60 miles away, they were like, you've got to be kidding me. So 
we said to them, we'll, put, we'll give you $1,000 if you move with us to Tiny Town, and we'll put it in a bank account. And when you're like 16 or something, you can use it to like put a down payment on a car or something. And I mean, paying like a kid in elementary school to move sounds really bad, I realize that. So, but here's the funny part of the story. When about two months into the beginning of the restoration of Antrim, when there looked like a thousand workmen were tearing the place to shreds, um, Richard said, Brandon Ryan, could I borrow that money back? <laughs> and they never did get their money back. <laughs> but answer the other question, no way. They are like so far removed from ever wanting, I shouldn't say ever, because you don't know what the future brings, but um, Brandon's a teacher. He's a, a, at the middle school, uh, head of the middle school at Boys Latin, where he graduated from high school, and um, very happily lives in Baltimore, a normal life in a normal house with a wife and a, ch- and a daughter. Um, they do love to come out and visit, but mm, no. And then my other son has three children and a lovely wife. They live in Greenwich, and he commutes to... New York City. So he wasn't really destined to live to to be an adult in Tiny Town, I don't think. But who knows? They might come back. You never know. But they're happy where they are, and they saw what we went through, and they don't want to do that. <laughs> Anyone else? I think um, I don't want to take up your time. Thank you very much, Dor. You're welcome. Thank you.